This is a book um, about African dancers in the gold mines. Inside it, there is a dance program that was held at the Fentus Post Gold Mining Company Limited in June 1960. And it says, Zulu men, particularly from the southern part of Natal, have developed a kind of step dance which nowadays is performed in Wellington gumboots, from which the dance derives its name of boots. copied from a dance executed by Russian sailors at Durban docks in the early days of the port. The dance consists of slapping and clapping the boots in time to music on a guitar, and a perfect performance is undoubtedly the result of many hours of serious rehearsal. There definitely is too strong a likeness to some of the German folk dancers for, for it to be coincidental. The German missionaries banned the indigenous forms of dancing. And the theory is that they introduced their own kind of Lederhosen type slapping dances. And these were taken on by the students and reinterpreted um, into a kind of slapping dance using the sound of the shoes. It does seem that everybody you talk to who says that they're an authority on gumboot dancing has a slightly different version of how it evolved. I tend to think that there may be a little bit of truth in the version of the origin of gumboot dancing that comes from these dancers in Soweto. Their um, theory is that um, gumboot dancing started in the mines when the workers were required to wear gumboots to stop their flesh from rotting in the fetid water, you know, it was cheaper to provide gumboots than to pump the water out of the mines. They believed that some of the workers were shackled to their position. They believed that the miners were forbidden to speak and that they started to slap the boots as a way of communication. It's like a primitive Morse code. Whether it's true or not, that seems to me to be irrelevant. Um, it's true for them when they dance. Salute. Salute. It consists of a series of dance phrases which have names attached to them, like salute or police or train. Um, 
And often these themes come from the lives of the people who are dancing it or from political situations. And the main emphasis is probably on the onomatopoeic sounds that come from slapping the, the gum boots and the sounds of the bottle tops. And they give a description of the ideas that are going through the minds of the dancers. For example, train would probably start with uh, a sound of, of people running and then overlaid with that you would hear the sound of the, the train going over the tracks and tick, 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 um, of people jumping onto the train and then the kinds of noises that would happen on the train as well. During the apartheid times, black South Africans were not allowed to live in the cities. And so the villages were built outside of Johannesburg. And people would have to come in by train. And these places like Soweto, for example, had one exit so that movement in and out could be monitored. Later, during the political struggle, the trains became very important meeting places when the police were not always able to monitor what was going on. When we're looking at each other like this, it's like I'm in a train and then, hi, brother, you're here. Oh, I'm here, okay. Hi, brother, you're here, you know. Uh, most of the trains, you know, they've got different sounds. Like some are noisy, some are like quiet, you know. Maybe if I am saying, ka, ka, la, ka, la, another one will say, twiri, 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 you know. Like the wheels are not having an oil. We have so many train songs in South Africa because the train is what broke the country up, what took the country from us, what stole our riches. And the train is what broke families up. The fathers used to go to, uh, have to go to the big city to go and work. When we were kids and the train used to pass by, it was just a, a normal thing to say, hey, Stimela, bring my mother back, or bring my father back. I'm coming from very far. A thousand miles away to Jobeka. Helen The mine system relied on labor that came from rural areas in South Africa and from other parts in Southern Africa and still does to this day. Leaving my wife behind taking care of the children. People would migrate to Johannesburg because it offered opportunities of money and employment. In the city of gold! And of course the migration system allowed only males to travel to the cities. And so the families and the women were left in the countryside. And the men were, were then forced to live in the most appalling situations in the mines. There are pictures of the kinds of dormitories that they had, which were nothing more than cement troughs in which they would have to sleep. I used to be away from, my family, from 9 to 15 months at a time. It was a very difficult time for us. Their lives were so sad. You know, I mean, there's nothing like being taken away from your family to come and live in celibacy by force. It's the only way you can work, you know, uh, uh, for months and months, you know. And at the same time, there were such noble people with so much humanity. Of course I missed him, but I had no complaints. He was sending money home for the family every month.
Think of people who come from 2,000 miles away. You know, that they, they left their families, and all they do is to go underground and come and sleep, go underground and come and sleep. On the weekend, of course, they're going to drink and dance throughout. So every time they're not underground, it's party time. Yes, we used to drink a lot, but we would dance in teams first, and then the drinking would really start. They invented um, competitions for the mine workers on the Friday and the Saturday, uh, in perhaps an attempt to stop over inebriation happening on those evenings because that would also be an irritation to the mine managers. I had a childhood where I grew up around miners. I served them, I saw them work with my parents, with my uncles, and I also like used to, uh, all the mines had amphitheaters and, and on the weekends uh, the mining companies had what they called amphitheaters so that the natives would let off steam and the tourists used to come and see. We used to compete one mining company against another. Our team was called the Porters. We would not necessarily compete for a prize. It was just a gathering of men showing off their gombut routines. We didn't have any special costumes, so we had to improvise by using clothes supplied by the mine management. They all get dressed up like warriors, you know. Skins all over the show, gum boots on, all, and they start, and they start. And I can guarantee you, where you sit, the ground's going to shake. And now the gum boot down by the butter. they call the boss boy or the boss man in, in the, the gun burning troops from the mines used to just shout out instructions, uh, shout out encouragement or saying, you know, this is the routine we're going to do next. We all spoke vernacular uh, and we used to use that to communicate with each other when we danced. A new language was developed during the mines called Fanagalor and it was developed by the white mine managers because they were not able to speak the many different languages that the mine workers had. And so they developed a kind of pigeon English that they used to communicate with the workers, whether they be Vendor or Kozo or Zulu or whatever. Your mine language is called Fanakalo. It's a slang language. It's seven languages mixed. English, Afrikaans, Zulu, Koza, Changa, Sutu, Mswazi, right? Now I'm going to speak to you in Fanakolo. I'm going to speak about my hands and my fingers, yeah? You ready? Roskari Hazikolo Masanda Kawen, Wanaya Savenza Panzi Kulgudin, Pezo Put, Putsa, Hazikolo Job, La Pacatina, uh uh, Hazikoma Spare. Roskari Wanafuno Spare, I'm a Pezo La Flo Bloody Oka Bazaar. The criteria for these dance forms are very, very strict. I mean, we might not have choreology, or, but uh, certainly in terms of groups and in terms of um, choreography and technique, um, there are very, very strict standards. Every day after work, we had meetings to talk about our gunboat routines. We practiced a lot and were very disciplined and there was a sort of unwritten law between us about that. It was very important to do your best. Certainly routines have to be unique and people will know if you've gone and ripped off another routine.
Gambit dancing would in a way form a kind of local newspaper that the issues of the day could be aired uh, and you would get to know about them through the song or through the chanting that was attached to the dancing. So it did certainly take on a, a political expression. Uh, when you talk about campus, you know, you talk about old days in South Africa and the apartheid times, and which is not a nice thing sometimes to talk about, you know. Apartheid was a bad um, law that was brought in by the government then, who were discriminating blacks against whites. For instance, there were toilets for blacks and toilets for whites. And you go into shops, you couldn't stand next to a white woman or white man and buy the same thing that they bought. And worse still, when it came now to a, a head, it is when the government was actually forcing our children to do all subjects in Afrikaans. The Nationalist government wanted all education to be in Afrikaans. And of course most people didn't speak that language and therefore their education would be limited and their job opportunities would be limited. Then the students just said enough is enough and that's when the riots started. Soweto 1976 was a, a, a turning point in, in our history. A moment where the world could see the kinds of brutalities that were being inflicted on South Africans by South Africans. It was like, oh, you know, sitting like this, the, you'll hear gunshots, pow, 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 pow. You know, when you look outside, oh, the smoke tear gas all over. So everyone was a victim, you know. I don't remember how I was shot, but I, I, I just saw myself the next day in hospital and uh, they were even talking, you know, the doctors that they might amputate my, my leg because of, you know, it was not looking good by then. And then I left and then I ran away because I was scared that maybe if I tell anyone, we'll tell the police and they'll come and kill me. After June 16th, the riots spread beyond Soweto to other black townships around Johannesburg and Pretoria. They ultimately reached Cape Town, more than a thousand miles away. Sympathy demonstrations also occurred at white, colored, and black universities in South Africa. According to official government figures, 294 people were killed in the first week of rioting in Soweto. I think the picture of Hector Peterson being carried was flashed around the world. It encapsulated, I suppose, the slaughter of the innocents. As a result of that, there was the cultural boycott. There's been quite a lot of debate as whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. I think it was obviously a, a very good thing in the sense that, that the white South Africans were ignoring uh, what was happening on the street. Youth clubs were very important after 1976, after Soweto Rite, and children go to school and education was in chaos. Usually women saw to it that children were occupied and these youth clubs were formed either in halls or in people's houses, matchbox houses in Soweto and other townships as well. When the apartheid started in earnest, then in, we felt uh, we must just join in and do something for the children. I went to a course in London and I told them about our plight in South Africa, that we have youth that are roaming the streets and not having anything to do. So it would be nice if we could get some funds so that we could put up a structure and that they will be using it as their youth club uh, centre. And God is so good, we managed to get 10,000 donation. If I'm not uh, mistaken, we were like eight to nine years old. Yeah. We discovered that uh, we are neighbours. You know, when we ask each other, where are you from? Okay, I'm, I'm just around the corner, the same street. So it's then we, we met them in a youth centre. Well, in Tabisonga Club, they used to do like uh, many activities like uh, Zulu traditional dance, uh, Kampu dance, music, drama. So what attracted me that 
the music they were doing. I used to play the penny whistle as well and do the gambo dance, maple, uh, traditional dances, dramas, you act with them. Because if you don't do a thing with these young people, they just say, oh, it, there, there's no fun. Two, four, chess. So we did the gambo dance and I would tell them, if you don't do it properly, you're not going to compete because I don't want to be number two. Our motto is number one. You go over the interview song, you sing, you dance. Till late, you go home, you sleep, you wake up tomorrow. You know your schedule, you know, life schedule. You know what you're doing, you know, yeah. Because of Mrs. Makud. She helped us a lot, not only for me, but if I take a look around my community. If you have problems, you don't have shoes, you know, you can't afford school fees, you know, he, she used to pay for you and buy you uniform. I was a duck before joining the youth club. I was busy running around in the street, pinching, doing whatever. So those guys, they, they put me down and tell me that, no, don't do this. If you do this, you're going to die. Vincent was a troublesome boy. Very troublesome, but very good. When you scold him, he gets very angry, and then he says, I can leave that lab. I said, what if you want to leave? Suits me, go. But if you walk out of that door, don't come back. That would stop him because he knew what if he leaves, where is he going to go? KK just has that winning look. He's a great compliment to the others on stage. He seems to be sort of the rock, the workhorse upon you know which everybody else um, sort of builds what they're doing. He's always there. He's always performing. You know, his performance never varies. It's fantastic. And then there's Siponjela. Oh, uh, tall and quiet, uh, when you tell him to do something, he, he came out of the hut. When people warm to Sipu, they, they're the things that they, they say, oh, you know, he's the tall one, with that great smile. And short, you know, is the other end of the spectrum, and he is short, short by name, short by physique as well. He was always worried that maybe he's done something wrong. When he's being called, he'll just look at you like this as if maybe you say, what have I done now? Then there comes Nicholas Nene, small, and the grandmother would report him every day and say I must punish him. And then I just said, ah, let's leave him, he's a young man, he'll be okay. And Tommy seems to be sort of like the hitman of the group, who, you know, is sort of slightly rougher around the edges. I don't know what was in their minds when they went into Mrs. Makuba's classes when they were in their 20s and uh, in the early 80s and decided that they would learn to do the cha-cha and gumboot dancing and learn about their Zulu heritage. Certainly to, to make that decision to form a group and to go out onto the streets to earn money um, reveals to me that they, they sensed that they were pursuing some sort of path of improvement or securing their future or something. And then sort of world events caught up with them and has propelled them maybe beyond um, their wildest dreams. First I was doing it for fun and be happy, you know, and to get together with some other friends, you know. I was doing it for that. But now I realise that uh, this can make some money, you know. That's where we went to bask, you know. We went to the streets of Johannesburg tried to cravel uh, some money, you know, for, to survive, you know, around here. Yes, yes, we did survive a lot by basking, you know, yeah. Because, like, when, while we were basking, you know, some of us, they don't have boots. So why do we have that small change we did to collect and go and buy some new pair of boots? We used to bask for about maybe six or seven hours a day. You know, we started early in the morning, maybe at 10 o'clock. Imagine the sun shining, you know. Sometimes, you know, if you bask, it can happen whereby you don't get anything, you know. So you have to be patient and then you, 
They have to be talkative there. Ask them, please, this is a non-profit making group, you know, so would you kindly please give us some small change? We started developing more and more and more, you know, till we met these guys, Senzi and Dali. The way we discovered them, I was running the Market Theatre Laboratory. We developed what we call Community Theatre Festival. The Community Theatre Festival is the festival of the community groups that haven't appeared anywhere else. Maybe you'll be seeing them for the first time. And if I'm not wrong, that's where we started to see the boys. And um, we've been told, I mean, some people have seen them in Bruma Lake basking, etc. And we saw them basking. But this time, they actually came and say, we want to be in the festival. <laughs> And then by that time, it was the morning of Saturday, the morning of the festival. Everything was set up. The programs were made, everything was there. And we just thought we got to slot them somewhere. And actually, they opened the festival. And then they told us, guys, you can be successful out of your tents, and we can develop it. We didn't first believe, you know, because uh, we have met so many guys like him, you know, telling us this and that. and. At the end of the time, they don't come, you know. I went to Deep Loof, I met them, and I saw what they were doing. I came back to Tali, I said, Tali, I'm not happy with that. what these guys are doing, really. If I have to work with these guys, I have to start afresh. And, you know, if, if really I have to, you know, start afresh, that's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> but you have to tell them that I don't like what they are doing. And, and I think I don't want to use their venue for rehearsals because of, it looks like it's a community hall. Everybody's there. You don't have you know, privacy and you can't tell them other things because of anyone. Just will just come in and say, okay, no, you're doing this step wrong. You're supposed to do it. You know, so you'll end up being not a supervisor or a director. You'll end up being like one of them. Then he was having patience to us to say, guys, no, you've got good things. Your campus is very perfect and we are good guys. So. For me, me, I'll give you how to work in, in the theater, what you, what you must do, what you must not do. So we have to be careful, guys, because in the theater, it's not like the same in the street. There were buskers before, and they, they never knew the discipline of theater. They never knew how, what it, how it is to perform in a theater. People, they're just sitting like this. I was even very, very nervous. I didn't believe myself that I will make it, <laughs> but it was OK. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And there were only six boys. And they got into the, onto the stage. And people saw that they never seen before. When Wayne Harrison came into the country to watch the show, we sat together. To set, you know, to, to work out, you know, kind of a document of working principles, how we're going to work from here. At that stage, the uh, the Rashili Gambu dancers of Sweta were just six guys uh, sitting on stage. The show didn't really have much shape to it. Um, they sang, they uh, danced up a storm, they played guitar and one drum, uh, but it was fairly limited. There were three lighting cues, I think, in the entire show. There was no set at all. Um, it was very economical to tour. Uh, they got fantastic reviews for the show they did and a um, standing ovation at the performance I saw. There was something winning about them. There was something charismatic, particularly you know, with, with performers like Vincent. You just saw that there was something quite special there, that, you, that if you could just get to him and direct him and polish him a little, you know, he could turn into um, uh, something quite out of the ordinary. If I'm a Zulu and I met maybe somebody who is a, a Sutu, we used to like insult each other. Like, so I decided to write this song. You know. With this song, I'm saying, let us unite and leave as one. It calls my Africa. Divided we 
to actually encounter a group of of gumboot dancers who sang beautifully, who sang like Lady Smith Black Mombozo, and uh, you know did some really neat harmonies, and uh, then to find out that most of the songs they were using were their own composition seemed to me to be a huge attraction, and gives you a lot of stuff to uh, work with. I'm crying here that he, uh, I've took a wife, but the wife is, is a drunker. Tommy was sitting alone. It was lunchtime, and then we were having our break, eating food, and then playing his song like he's lonely, thinking somewhere he was out of the place. He said, okay, Tommy, I like that song. Can you use that song? The challenge of working with Zenzi is how we could um, alter, uh, evolve, um, add to what was there, or you know, sort of enhance what was there, to make it into uh, not a not a festival project anymore, but uh, a commercial product. Mr. Harrison came uh, working with us. Some of us, we thought, maybe he's coming to take our dance, you know, or change everything. But he said, I'm not going to change anything. But I'm a director. I've, I've got to maybe make it more. First thing was to um, bring on board a designer. And uh, my first choice was um, uh, Nigel Trifford. I got um, flown over to South Africa saw the boys in this nifty little hall in Soweto, saw, and with all uh, the community of Soweto there, which is great, and all clapping and cheering and carrying on, and realised, in fact, that the show is, works perfectly well without any of my stuff. <laughs> well, that's a good starting point. And then I had a vision in the middle of the night, after about two days, some kind of structure that I knew I, I wanted to build, because I like building things. And then we went out to another gig, way out in the suburbs, and passed by the vision. There was the vision on the side of the road, and it was a gold mine. And then we said to them, well, now is the point of no return. You have to tell us at this stage whether you want to keep your show the way it is, and it's very successful, and you can go on doing the um, the festival circuit and maybe do one or two um, festivals a year or you can come on this bigger adventure with us this bigger journey and allow us to build this set for you and see what happens when we place you in it and uh, evolve your show and something else but it really was a point of no return and they had to decide I think it was Tami who uh, turned to me and said, and to Nigel and said, oh, this is superior, this is superior, we want to go with this. And, that, and then everybody applauded and the die was cast. What he does is he creates an interactive set. You cannot work with a Nigel Triffitt set and not be on it, not be using it, not allow it to a certain extent, to dictate the nature of your show. The guys were performing their original show at the Hong Kong Festival, doing six performances there. And we took a model of the set, and uh, you know Nigel's, bol Nigel's balsa wood model, and uh, he'd, he'd done little cutouts of each of the dancers and that, and put them on there and moved them around the set and, and showed them, and, and uh, it was sort of like a little a little toy theatre show that we did for them. He started to play around, he said, you see this section of the set is going to move, and this one is going to move, this one is going to come down. The show is about gumboot dancers who work down a gold mine, and why do they wear gumboots? Because the roof leaked and water came down, and hence all these slots in the stage that can, trays that can hold water. So we'll have moments where there'll be water dripping. Zenzi and the guys have been 
incredibly generous and adventurous in the way they've embraced new ideas, whether they come from Zenzi or from me or from Nigel. But there have been a lot of ideas put in there and a lot of new work has been done. And we continue to do it as we um, sort of respond to, you know, critical and audience reaction to the show. <laughs> The Supremes were probably the next major element added to the show after Nigel. They're there to give Zenzi more elements to play with. In terms of the vocals, I mean, they add great vocal strength to the show. They, um, they add visual variety to it in that uh, just when you're not expecting it, three new characters come into the show and actually re-engage the audience. The idea of the Supreme to came in to support the singing part while the guys are, are you know, they're breathing out, they're taking their energy again, etc. So then the Supremes are just, you know, covering that gap all the time. They're also incredibly good looking. They bring a sort of like uh, uh, a sex element into it as well. You know, not that the you know, original guys aren't sexy and by that stage everybody's worked out which of the six core dancers they want, but then on come these sort of very attractive looking guys. Everybody goes, oh, where did they come from? <laughs> When they dance, they have to dance as a, a troupe. And that, that level of discipline, um, and I know they think of me as a disciplinarian, but uh, it seemed to me to be essential uh, if they were going to evolve their work beyond um, what it was originally. And I try to encourage them to be very exact in what they do, to be in the moment, every moment, so nothing that they do on stage is uneconomical, is wasted, is loose, is sloppy. That they really think as performers every moment that they're on stage. Getting back together for the first time in um, you know, a couple of months. Now they're here and they're focused and hopefully warmed up and ready to go. OK, guys, why don't we just gather around here? Sit around and just have a little explanation about what we're going to do during the week. Which is... Nigel's been working very hard over the summer, sort of just re-evaluating the set, and we're making some changes to the set, which I'll explain to you in a minute. At the same time, Zenzi and I want to just play around with, with bits of content. We want to put in a couple of uh, new numbers, play around with a bottle top number, just to explain what the bottle tops are all about. Zenzi and I are, are friends. I think we're great collaborators. He is a very talented director who had taken these guys from the streets of Joburg and worked with them into creating a picture beyond just six guys sitting on stage and hitting gumboots. When we wear our gumboots, we put in foam. We call it sponge here at home. And then we put in some bandages to hold the sponge and then you put in soccer socks mm. and then you put in our boots. And once you hit it, it, it goes boop, boop, ah, nice, sound. nice sound. It gives nice sound when you put in some sponge there. And the shakers. Mm. Yeah. Though you know the history about shakers and chains. Yeah, it's yeah. like that. It's back when the miners were chained. The bottle tops around our ankles make it sound like Christmas. They remind us of the chains that kept the mine workers in the mines. And Mandela told us how to take off the chains. And to rebuild our country. The show is, is a celebration. And it's a celebration of the triumph of all kinds of disasters that our country has gone through. 
whether it's economic, whether it's political, whether it's colonization, is a triumph of that. And what we see happening today in the mines is not something new. It's been there all the time. For every drop of water, a man lives and dies in the mines. Now we sing and dance for them. There was one serious accident where I was trapped on the ground for a long time. There were six of us down there. We were fortunate because we were rescued. I didn't think God was with us, but after that experience, I believed that there was a God after all. I could never go down a deep mine again. I just don't have the courage. Mining is still as dangerous as ever. I wouldn't be surprised if there was another disaster tomorrow. Rescue teams are getting closer to the 15 miners trapped underground at African Rainbow Minerals Gold Mine at Orkney. Two of the men are seriously injured, presumed dead. One is still missing. Four others are confirmed dead. The miners' ordeal began yesterday during a rock fall caused by a seismic event measuring 2.9 on the Richter scale. It took rescuers more than nine hours today to advance a mere four meters. Mine accidents have claimed more than 69,000 lives and seriously injured a million more. Over the past 94-year period, more than 47,000 tons of gold were produced from South African mines. This means that for every 1.2 tons of gold produced, at least one man gave his life. I interviewed a miner who didn't want to give his name. Um, he was telling me a little bit about what it's like at the mines, why he came here. It's basically just um, a very hard life for them. A lot of them, that's all that they know, and every day they keep going down, even though it's dangerous and frightening for them, especially when they've seen colleagues are trapped in it. He left his family behind. He goes and tries to visit them once a month um, in Swaziland. There's still that, you know, we're going to come and make our fortune in the mines, and for, I mean, with the salaries they earn, there's no way these guys are ever going to fulfill those dreams. And now with the gold price not as, as, as high as it was, any mines are, uh, have to choose between closing or working in perhaps fairly dangerous situations. The closing of the mines. When I step back in a set uh, during the show, I'm saying, please, big bosses, do not close the mines. I need to work here. I've got three children, and they all depend on me. So if you close the mines, why should I work? You know, so I'm depending on you. Please, don't close the mines. When that mine is on its last legs, got no more gold left, then they've got to get rid of the people, not so? So they retrench them. You want to go, you go. If you don't want to go, they transfer you to another mine again. That's how they work it. Gold price dropped. It became, it became uneconomical. You know, mines wear out, like we do. They become, the, the gold veins become thinner and thinner and thinner. You might go too deep to get the gold. So it's, it was an economic decision. But the mine itself, yes, is, is, is an asset for us. That's why we're here. That's why we're actually in this spot, because we inherited this mine, we rejuvenated it. There's nowhere under the sun like Gold Reef City. It's a mix of gold mining history, African art and culture, turn-of-the-century hostelries and Victorian-style shops. Johannesburg was a rollicking mining town, and nothing has changed at Gold Reef City. It is a celebration of the evolution of a city, 
Some may say that um, there's not much to celebrate about the past because of the days of apartheid, but we've embodied the old and the new. We've got a permanent troupe of 20 tribal dancers here now. A small part is a gum boot. <laughs> Culture is a word that um, those of us on the commercial side of life, which we are, almost shy away from because culture doesn't sell. What is new about Gumboots is the respect that it was given. And it was wonderful to see kind of a Broadway-style show. A very important uh, ingredient were, were the uh, Australian producers, because we have enormous talent in this country, but we need skills. We need that expertise to take us further. I think that audiences abroad see South Africa um, through rosy-coloured spectacles. And I think that the productions that do go overseas are very celebratory. They demonstrate enormous energy, um, vibrant bodies, uh, a lot of um, excitement, um, and I suppose are read as liberation themes. Um, it's only part of the story. There's still a great deal of liberation to happen in this country. One of the things that we have learned in each other and then we're trying to, is to plow back what you know to the people that help you to grow up. You know, not only your parents help you to grow up, even the children that you used to play with in the street help you to grow up. So if you plow back to them, you know, that's more important. And what you, you saw Tammy do in teaching the little kids come dancing is plowing back. He says, I've seen more than you have seen. I share with you what I've seen. And that's what development and empowerment is about. Where do you go to find gumboot dancers? Well, I mean, my first stop would be Soweto. Really, you know, there's sort of a grapevine that works about gumboot dancing. I mean, the success of these guys is actually sort of spreading through the community. Since the success of the show, it's become sort of a centre of gumboot dancing. I think we see it in, you know, next generations already. We see kampu dancing going into the world. We see it having to be accepted as the cultural form of uh, the historical background of South Africa. It has always been my dream to be to go to Broadway, and this is the only company that I feel will make it into Broadway. So I'm so very lucky to be in this company, and I feel so proud to be working with kampu. I think it's open for us. I think we're going to tour the whole world, not only America, because people around, they don't know this dance, and they need to see this kind of a dance, the magic made from South Africa. Our past uh, was, was dictated by white authority, you know, and um, I think that uh, our future is going to be molded by that black thing that they tried to take away from us. Africa is like still the undiscovered cultural miracle of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we have enjoyed being with you today. Especially you, woman, with your shining teeth. Gumbo dancers are seemingly a next big thing in terms of a percussive primal entertainment that was all a rage in the 90s and continues to be a rage in the, um, the new millennium. And I find it um, you know, incredibly rewarding seeing them rise to the challenge. Um, and uh, th that for me has been you know, one, of the, one of the great um, legacies of the project. I really feel good that at least it was not a wasted effort on my side and on the side of their parents, because the parents had the confidence in me in giving over these children to me to work with them. And the way they've... Uh, shown themselves and the way they've improved and went through with this gumboot dance 
I really feel proud of them. It's a proud moment for me. If I've become rich with my campus and I want to get the house for myself, I want to help my family because some of them, they want to go to school. I want to buy a house and make sure that my family live a good life because I've never had that. I've got a daughter. I want to take her to school, you know. She must learn, not like me, because me, I did go to school, but I didn't finish it, you know. I have a dream to be a director and have my own dance company. And I want to teach the children of Soweto how to dance. For me, I think I need to open a school, maybe a dance school, so that children will come and dance over there and be discovered and be talented and be something out of this world. Now we are together, you know, because of the dance, you know, we can communicate. That uh, makes me feel Good. This young generation who are coming now, they, are, they really like to do the gambut dance. You know. Gambuts will carry on and on. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela,
to teach you. Oh. Yeah, a mind will cut so. It goes like this. That's right. That's right. sing Come 
I'm coming from very far, a thousand miles away to Jobeka. Helelele Jobeka, to Jobeka. Helelele Jobeka. Leaving my wife behind, taking care of the children, working for a living underground in the city of gold. Hemi Cotini, 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 Working for living under God's mercy. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. Oh, seven as my, let me go to him. Let me go to him. South Africa. Oh, so Oh! 
Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> you, woman. Oh. You're so beautiful. Oh. You're so sexy. Oh. Your shining set of teeth is so attractive, you know. Oh. I you know what? what? I wish that I could have a dinner with you tonight. Whoa! What an offer! How oh, about it? Hi guys! Hi! 
am fully game. I'm fully me. Oh, me, I'm fully game. Oh, me, I'm fully you. I can't understand. You can't understand. Are you fooling me? Are you fooling me? Oh, me, I'm fooling you. Oh, me, I'm fooling you. Hi, ladies. Hi, ladies. Are you fooling the me? Are you fooling the me? Oh, the me, I'm fooling the you. Oh, the me, I'm fooling the you. What do you mean? What is the meaning? What shall I do? Got your pen, but I saw on top. Hi, hi, hi. I am too sexy. Yeah. 
C'est when night time comes, the mine workers drink and talk about their families a thousand miles away. Oh, they drink and dance for each other. Oh, they drink and drink and drink. Oh, This umkomot is too strong. Shipping, who is in was, 
drop of water a man lives and dies in the mines now we sing and dance for them